time, please take your seat. Service is about to begin. Please take this time to silence all electronic devices now. Here at CWC, giving is not only a privilege, but also an act of worship. Please drop off your gift in any of our wooden boxes around campus or head online to cwccs.org and click the Give button. Or you can text your gift to the number on the screen or in your bulletin. Enjoy today's service. Well, what's up, Calvary Worship Center? How we doing? Y'all doing all right on this warm and hot day? <laughs> Definitely kidding. It is freezing, literally. So, hey, let's stand together and worship. Sorry, my little headphones are messing up. Are y'all ready to worship Jesus? Yeah. Amen. All right. You know, every time it's been cold, I always say, you know, it's like it's cold outside, but it's about to get hot up in here. <laughs> We're about to worship Jesus and get warm for Jesus. Amen. Y'all ready? One, two, three, four.
somebody tonight at your house. I need you to turn towards them and say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all. You may be seated. Welcome to Calvary Worship Center. It's great to see you all tonight. You guys are brave coming out here tonight. Well, it's good to be with you because we're going to get into God's word. Amen. Amen. Hey, hey, come on now. Well, we're excited to be with you guys. We're going to be in Acts chapter 25 and 26. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get ready for us. Uh, For those of you joining us at home, get ready as well because God has a word for you as well. Uh, We're excited about what God is going to do tonight. We're going to continue in our time of worship. We're going to continue in his word, and we're excited for how God is going to speak to our hearts. I want to let you know, if this is your first time, we want to welcome you here, and we want to encourage you, please stop by our Life Center, because we'd love to be able to meet you, love to be able to see how we can get you connected here at Calvary Worship Center, and give you a free gift, which is really cool. Uh, We have a couple more announcements for you, but for those, you have to turn your attention to the screen. Hello everyone, my name is Reggie Pittman and we're so happy that you've joined us today. If you're a first time visitor, make sure you fill out a new visitor's card found at the Life Center in our foyer. Once you fill it out and turn it in at the Life Center, you will get a new visitor's gift bag. Also, when you get done talking with someone at the Life Center, you'll get a free beverage card to use at our coffee house, NUMA. Now, pull out your phone and load up the church app so you can sign up and follow along as we check out these announcements. Come discover how you can get involved here at CWC at our next Discover class. Some great areas to serve are our children's ministry and our audio ministry. The children's ministry has the amazing opportunity to help raise the next generation to follow Christ. While our audio ministry not only helps mix the sound in-house, but also online to hundreds of people, helping spread the gospel all around the world. Our next Discover class is this Sunday at 1.45 p.m. You'll learn about the church, what we believe, how to volunteer, and more. Have you ever avoided conversations because you weren't sure how to address touchy subjects? Have you felt defenseless in guiding your children through our ever more sinful society? If you're a parent or interested to learn more, we encourage you to join our family workshop on February 26th and 27th. We'll examine what's invading our schools, society, and our homes, and help you gain an understanding of how to use your Christian perspective to bring about change. This workshop is free, You can sign up online or at the Life Center. Women, make sure you join the Women in His Image Bible Study. The Bible study will begin on Tuesday, February 16th for 11 weeks. 
Both morning at 9.30 a.m. and evening classes at 6.30 p.m. are available. You can sign up online or at the Life Center. Study materials cost $12 and childcare is provided. Our next baptism service will be held on February 28th at our 10 a.m. service. To be baptized, you must be at least seven years old and have completed the baptism form online. Orientation will be on February 21st at 1.45 in the sanctuary. Here at CWC, giving is not only a privilege, but also an act of worship. Your gift blesses the community, people in need, missions, ministry, and so much more that ultimately helps spread the gospel. Please drop off your gift in any of our wooden boxes around campus or head online to cwccs.org and click the Give button. Or you can text your gift to the number on your screen or in your bulletin. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, want to sign up for an event, or just find out more about the church, stop by the Life Center. We have awesome people who would love to talk with you. You can also get more details and sign up for everything we just talked about by downloading our app. Just go to your app store and search CWCCS. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can listen to Pastor Al's radio messages by downloading the One Place app. Or you can visit us online at cwccs.org. Now let's get back into worship. God bless. Amen, Calvary. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with us and let's continue in worship me, Jesus, through song. Let's make it happen. One, two.
Let's put our hands together like this. Is mine. Hey. Hey. Everywhere I go, hey. everywhere I be, <laughs> oh Jesus is mine. Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise in his place.
Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is, un is unsearchable. Our generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. And I will declare your greatness. They, they shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. Can we bless his name right now together? They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You opened your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also, he also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Father, when we come together and we corporately gather, we are lifting you high above all else. Father, it's our prayer that you wouldn't just be the Savior, but that you would be the Lord of our lives. Father, all that we are is yours. Father, tonight would you, would you reign over our hearts? Would you reign over our circumstances? Would you reign over our addictions? Would you reign over our struggles, over our trials? Would you reign, God? Have your way.
church. You can raise your hands and praise if you want. And all God reigns. Hallelujah. We sing it. Forever your king reigns. I believe the Lord wants to move mightily in your hearts and we sing. Oh, in our God reigns. Yeah. Oh, in our God, you reign regardless of the weather, regardless of where we are, circumstances. Lord, you, we declare tonight that you reign. We enthrone you, dear God, in our hearts and in our minds. Father, that we might hear that which the Spirit is speaking to the church. Will you come tonight and by your hand fashion a people that will magnify your name, that will live in this present time, declaring to this world that you reign. May our lives reflect that very fact. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, amen. Good to see you this night. Praise the Lord. Boy, you guys are hardcore. Amen. No, it's good to see you tonight and uh, coming out on this snowy night, but uh, it's wintertime. Amen. Who'd have thunk it, right? Well, if you have a Bible, please open to Acts chapter 25. We are going to look at chapter 25 tonight, and uh, this is a Bible study, and we are going to uh, do, uh, go through chapter 29 and chapter 26. Amen. And i um, just going to dive right into the Word of the Lord tonight. And uh, chapter 25 is going to be kind of, we're going to go through it fairly quickly, kind of an overview that we get to chapter uh, 26, so uh, strap yourselves in, amen. It's going to be good. Last time we were together, we saw where Paul had been under house arrest in Caesarea for two years, and despite his many conversations with Felix, the governor Felix, Felix never decided regarding Paul's case. Now on the surface, as I was thinking about this, as I was looking at our study tonight, I thought, you know, uh, on the surface it would appear that Paul's time was being wasted. But the fact is, Paul was waiting on the Lord and not on Felix. I think sometimes we think our time is wasted in the Lord when we find ourselves waiting on people 
rather than waiting on the Lord. Waiting is not a natural characteristic of our flesh, but it is a characteristic of faith. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Are you waiting on the Lord tonight? Waiting on the Lord. It's not a sign of weakness, but of strength, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. So Paul was being strengthened during this time. Two years, imagine, two years waiting for his case to be resolved and all. And Felix leaves him under house arrest. And then he's succeeded by a man we saw last time in chapter uh, 24, verse 27, by the name of Proceus Festus. What a name, right? He was appointed by the emperor Nero, succeeded, he succeeds Felix as governor of Judea, and he reigns for about just under two years. He wasn't there very long. In, verses, in chapter 25, verses 1 to 5, Proceus Festus is being installed as governor, and um, in verses 1 to 5, we see the, the religious leaders, knowing that this new governor is coming in. Uh, quickly inform uh, Proceus uh, Festus uh, concerning their, this newly appointed governor, concerning their adversary, Paul. And so taking advantage of the fact that this new governor wanted to make a good impression on the Jews, uh, they requested that Paul's trial be moved from Caesarea back up to Jerusalem. Now, the reason they did that in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 25, it tells us because they were planning to assassinate Paul. And this is the second time that they're seeking to assassinate the apostle. Verses 4 and 5 tells us, however, that Festus, this newly appointed governor, uh, denied their request. As we see here in verse 4, Uh, where we read, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, uh, let those uh, who who have authority among you uh, go down with me and accuse the man, you know, before him. So if you guys want to accuse him, you want to, you know, have a case against him, then come down to Caesarea because that's where I'm going to be. Basically, is what Proceus Festus is saying here. In verses 6 to 9, Festus spends a few days, the Bible says here, in verses 6 to 9, in Jerusalem. And then he travels to Caesarea, uh, there by the coast in the Mediterranean Sea, in today, modern-day Israel. And on the following day, right after he gets there, he meets with Paul's accusers. However, as before, they cannot prove their case. And uh, their case cannot be proven. In fact, Paul declares in verse 8, he says this in verse 8, if you'll read along with me. He says, it says, while he answered for himself, Paul says, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. What a powerful testimony. Look at that. Paul says, I haven't offended in any of these things. You know, I mean, think about it. This should be our, the goal of our testimony as believers today. Because Paul, uh, uh, Paul could not, rather, be found guilty of being against the, the, uh, the, the word of God, the word. He didn't, he wasn't against the word. And, of course, here he's referring to the law, the law of Moses. He wasn't against the temple, against the culture of the temple, against the, the uh, ceremonies of the temple. He did not not do anything to offend uh, the uh, ceremonies and all of the temple. In fact, when he was on the Temple Mount in the riot, many of you will remember that uh, you know, he was purified. He was following, again, uh, the laws of the temple. Uh, today, you could say the temple would be the church. And the reason I say that is because the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, if you're taking notes, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that collectively we as believers are living stones built up into a spiritual house, a temple, whereby, again, the presence of God resides. God resides within his church. Amen? And, of course, he resides within the believer, for you are 
The Bible tells us the very temple of God. But he did not offend in word, and according to God's word. He did not offend according to the temple. He did not offend according to Roman, the Roman government. Interesting. What a testimony. Now, the only time I believe it's justified for believers to offend government is when government goes against the word of God. Amen? And when they go against the word of God, then we got to say, well, you know, like Peter said to the religious Jews in the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, when they said, don't preach in the name of Jesus ever again. And Peter said, you know, uh, you judge. Is it better for us to obey you or God? And so when the government comes across the church and, and, and you know, defies the word of God and says, well, you can't preach that anymore. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, we're going to preach it. Amen. Uh, because. Uh, we don't want to offend government, but we must obey God. Look at 1 Peter, if you'll turn in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2, and read what Peter says about our witness uh, in the world. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Amen. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, that's people traveling through, sojourners and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts. Am I in the right place? Yeah, I am. Chapter, verse 11. Amen. From fleshly lust, uh, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Amen. Whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those uh, who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants. Do you know you're a bond servant of God? What's a bond servant? A slave with no rights. Amen. He just called me a slave. Yeah. If you're in Christ, that's what you are. You're his servant. You're a bondservant to him. He's bondservants of God. He says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the president. Doesn't say president, says king. Amen. Paul said, I, I, I am not offended in, in relationship to the word of God. I'm not offended, you know, in relationship to the temple. I'm not offended in the relationship to government. That's the life the believer ought to lead. Not a life of offense. But a life seeking not to offend unless people defy the word of God. Then I must obey God rather than man. Amen. Amen. So we go back here to Acts chapter 25. and we, Like I said, we're going to peruse through here pretty quick. And uh, verses 10 and 11, Paul refutes the idea of moving his trial to Jerusalem because of his appeal uh, to go to Caesar. Uh, literally, he's placing himself under Roman authority. Verse 12, you read along with me in Acts chapter 25. It says, then Festus, because Paul said, hey, I, I'm appealing to Caesar. I'm under Roman authority. I'm not going to go to Jerusalem. And Festus, uh, uh, of course, in verse 9, he, he asked Paul, if that's the reason why he's saying this, because he asked Paul if he uh, would go to Jerusalem. And he was doing it to appease the Jews. He, he knew that uh, he shouldn't do it, but he thought the Jews are here. He's trying to appease them. And Paul Tells him, no, I'm, 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 I'm appealing to Caesar. In verse 12, it says, Then Festus, when he, he had uh, conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you shall go. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to, uh, to, greet, excuse me, to greet Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking 
for a judgment in Jerusalem, or a judgment against him. And so Festus, uh, Pontius Festus, um, has Bernice and uh, Agrippa II come down and he explains to them what's going on, uh, what he's dealing with at that particular time. Now, let me give you the 411 on Agrippa II and Bernice. Are you ready? Herod Agrippa II was, uh, Herod Agrippa II reigned from about 50 to 100 AD, and he was the son of Agrippa I and the great-grandson of Herod the Great, who uh, had the toddlers, Jewish male toddlers in Bethlehem, slaughtered because he was fearful that there were another king had been born. And that's in Matthew chapter 2. Many of us know the Christmas story. Agrippa was given the title of king, the king of Judea, by the Romans. Agrippa II was the eighth and final of the Herodian dynasty. There was a with Herod the Great, he had all these Herods that followed, and uh, you know he was the, the last Herod of the Herodian dynasty uh, to exist. Now, Bernice, <laughs> she has an interesting story. She was the oldest daughter of Herod Agrippa I, so she is the sister of Herod Agrippa II. Bernice was married at age 13, but the marriage was not consummated. Um, she was then married to her uncle. This is, this is like... Some made-up soap opera or something. She's married to her uncle, Herod, king of Chalcis, uh, which is in modern-day Syria, uh, with whom she had two sons. And after his death in A.D. 48, she lived with her brother, Herod Agrippa II, uh, mentioned here within our text. And in reaction to suspicion that their relationship was incestuous, she married Polemon, Polemon, a priest king of Cilicia, which is the region Paul was from, uh, the southeastern region of modern-day Turkey. Uh, but she soon left him and returned to her brother. And Bernice eventually became a mistress. It's a soap opera, amen? <laughs> a mistress uh, of, a Roma, of a, the Roman emperor, emperor Fes, uh, Fes, 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 Fespasian, amen, I'll get it out, Blah. And uh, Thespasian reigned from uh, 69 to 79 A.D., and she also had a fling with Thespasian's uh, son. So she got around. Um, one commentator wrote that Bernice and Drusilla, Drusilla was married to Felix, and said <laughs> Bernice and Drusilla uh, were two of the most corrupt and shameless women of their time. I would say if you wanted to look them up, look under G for gold digger. Amen. <laughs> that's kind of the way they live their lives. And so nothing new for Hollywood today, but that's Bernice and Agrippa II. And verses 16 to 20, Festus explains to Agrippa and Bernice why he was allowing Paul to, to appeal to Caesar. Uh, in Festus's mind, it all boiled down really to a dispute over religion and the resurrection. Uh, verse 19, if you'll read that along with me. In verse 19, we drop down here, and it says, but had, he said speaking, Festus speaking, says, let's start at verse 18. When the accusers, accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed. But had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Amen. This is debate was about the religion of the Jews, and, and their, their, their dispute was over the fact, was Jesus alive? And a dispute over the, uh, the, the resurrection. And thus Festus concluded in verse 21 and 22, we skip down here to verse 21, he says, but when Paul appealed to be, uh, appealed to be uh, reserved for the, for the decision of Augustus, Augustus was the reigning emperor of Rome at that time, he said, I commanded him uh, to be kept till I could send him to Caesar, again, the Roman authority in Rome. 
And then Agrippa and Festus, Agrippa said rather to Festus, I also would like to hear uh, this, the man myself. And he said to him, tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. In verses 24 to 27, like I said, we're just kind of going over chapter 25 here, but verses 24 to 27, uh, Festus presents a synopsis of Paul's case. Uh, Paul had presented, and we've seen that presented in previous chapters as Paul presented his case before Felix. I saw that last time. And now we get to chapter 26. See how quick that was? Amen. (laughs) Chapter 26. Amen. And in chapter 26... We begin here at verse 1, of course, and it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. And so Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. He said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. Especially... Because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. And so he appeals to King Agrippa. You know something about King Agrippa, that he was very familiar with the customs and all of of the Jews. And so Paul, in a sense, takes advantage of that, appealing to Agrippa here uh, before Festus. In verses 4 and 5, Paul speaks about his upbringing as a religious Pharisee. And in verses 6 all the way to verse 7, not far, (laughs) verse 7, the first part, Paul points out the fact that he was being judged by the very messianic hope given to the 12 tribes of Israel and the very hope in which he was raised. He's making a very good point here, as we see in verse 6. And now, he says, I stand in verse 6, and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God. What, What hope? The hope of the Messiah, of a Savior. To our fathers, to this promise, our, the, uh, our 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, earnestly serving God, might, uh, night and day, hope to attain. For this hope, this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. So he's making it, look, I was raised in this hope. It was a hope given to our fathers. And now that I'm declaring this hope that has been manifested in Christ, now I'm being accused uh, by the Jews here. And, um, you know, the very hope that they hope in, and the very hope that also Agrippa II understood. He was very, again, very familiar with uh, the Jewish tradition in all of that, and the Masonic promise and the customs of the Jews. In verses 9 to 11, uh, Paul shares how he was, uh, shares he was uh, once against these Christians, these believers, followers of Christ. And in verses 12 to 18, he shares his salvation story once again. And I'm not going over these things for purposely because we've gone over the salvation story. and We've st- gone through Paul's experience and all of that uh, several times. And he shares with him his his salvation story on the road to Damascus when he met Jesus. And the light appeared to him, and he he came to Christ. He obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Paul never, you know, I noticed something here as I was reading his testimony that he never really embellishes his uh, conversion experience. He doesn't add to it. He just tells it simply as it happened. And we read here in verse 12 a little bit about his testimony. I want to read this because in his testimony, he gives a little bit more information about what Jesus said to him. In verse 12, we read, while Paul says, while thus, while thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven. He says, brighter than the sun. Man, how bright was that? Shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when, I, and when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying to me in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, 
Jesus speaks Hebrew, amen. Well, we know he did, amen. Uh, people think when he get to heaven, he's going to be speaking another language. I don't know, he may be speaking Hebrew. So we'll, we'll know Hebrew when we get there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> amen. And the voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads are those sharp sticks they would use when they, with the oxen, as they were plowing with the oxen, and, and uh, you know, the oxen wouldn't want, wouldn't want to go on, and you had this little sharp stick, it was a goad, you, you know, you stick the thing in the oxen's backside or whatever, you know, and it, whoop, it keeps going, right? Why are you kicking against, and sometimes the oxen would do that, kick against the goads. Goad you on, you've heard that phrase maybe. And so he said, why are you kicking against the goads? And maybe he's saying that to someone tonight. Maybe you're watching online or whatever. God's saying, why do you keep kicking against my conviction? The things I'm convicting you about. So I said, Paul says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have uh, appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which, uh, which you have heard, you have seen rather, and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Now this is the part, uh, I don't, you know, I don't, haven't read in the other conversion experiences, but he says, and I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Wow. I mean, right there, the Lord lays out just his whole mission statement, his purpose in coming. Here's why I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And I'm going to deliver you from the Jews, but here's why I'm sending you. He lays it out there for Paul. Again, Paul is just basically sharing his testimony. Very simple. Nothing embellished here. And there is power. There is power in the simplicity of your story. I've said it many times before, and it's so true. Sometimes we want to embellish our testimony and turn it into a bragamony, but just tell your story about what God has done for you. In simplicity. God uses the simple things. Uh, I was out shoveling snow the other day. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, but uh, my neighbor came over. And um, a few months ago, we had started, sitting, uh, started uh, showing on television here locally the little simple invitation to Christ, inviting people to pray to sinner's prayer. And we've had some people pray to prayer, and they would we fill out the information and, and all, you know, and uh, it's, it's been a blessing. I don't know, we probably had a dozen people or so that, you know, fill out the information. I actually took the time to call in and, you know, prayed the sinner's prayer and all that. But he came by, and, you know, it's just a simple commercial. It wasn't some elaborate thing. And, uh, and many of you may remember it, maybe not. But he um, came over, hey, you know, I just, I've got to ask you a question. You know, aren't you on that commercial? <laughs> you know, I, yeah, that's me, you know. And uh, he was like, yeah, you know, I just kind of, you know, need to get back into church and got some, just want to talk to you. Said, hey, come over anytime. Go over to the church. It's not far from here, you know, where, where we live and, and all that. But I thought, praise the Lord. I've been there a year, over a year. And uh, he came over the other day and I thought, just something so simple, not, you know, that God uses. And I think it's the same way with our testimonies. It's just, you know, maybe you don't think it's much. Or maybe you said something that's mine, you just, you know, you don't think as much, and God uses it. And then it might be a year later they come back around and go, hey, you know, remember you, you know, you said something to me or what have you. You know, let God use you. Yes, even the simple things. It doesn't have to be a sermon. Well, let me give you a 45-minute sermon. No, you don't need a 45-minute sermon. Just tell your story in simplicity, and God will use it. God uses the simple things. So I thank God for that. And I hope he comes. hope he comes. Amen. In the words of Christ that Paul shares here, I find in Paul's testimony, I find three 
attributes, really, of the gospel. And they're found in verse 18, the latter part uh, of uh, Paul's testimony. The first attribute that I find here, that we see here, is that Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. He came to open our eyes to deliver us from spiritual blindness that we might run, or turn rather, from darkness to light. And to deliver us from the power of Satan to God. That's why the Lord comes. That's why he opens our eyes and we can see things. You know, when you, when you can't see, amen, <laughs> you don't know where you're going. It's pretty obvious. But when your eyes are open, I remember when I first came to Christ and my eyes are open and I could see things. I looked at the world in a totally different way. My eyes were open to things. I could see things. I could see that's, that, that path that I was going down was a path of destruction. I mean, he opened my eyes to see those things, but I couldn't see them before. And there's a lot of people you'll share the gospel with or whatever they can't see, but Christ came to open their eyes. It's amazing when he opens your eyes, you go, whoa, man, look where I was headed. And now you've come to follow Christ, and, and not only has he delivered you, opened your eyes, but he has also delivered you from the power of Satan, because Satan has power, and power to blind people and to deceive people. We see it in our, our society even today. And so many are blinded by the enemy, and they don't know they're blind. Yeah, that's the worst thing. Somebody don't know they're blind, right? They run around bumping into stuff all the time. Like, hey, you gotta move that out of the way. I'll pass a law to get that out of the way. No, just open your eyes. Amen. Just open your eyes, and you'll see the truth. Amen. The Bible says in Colossians chapter one, verses thirteen and fourteen, that He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. He has redeemed us. He's opened our eyes to see. And secondly, he grants us forgiveness. We just saw there in Colossians chapter 1, he grants us forgiveness. But Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 also says that in him we have redemption through his blood. Amen. The forgiveness of sins. Amen. According to the riches, I love this, of God's grace. Amen. How does God forgive us? According to grace. And God is so rich, no matter how great of a debt you have, God can pay it off. Amen. No matter how great the debt of sin is, God can pay it off. And we need forgiveness. This is one of the greatest needs of mankind. We need to be forgiven. People are wondering what's going on in their lives and all frustrated and, and upset with people and mad all the time. Sometimes it's just, you know, have you been forgiven? We need forgiveness from God, which enables us to forgive others. Grudges, unforgiveness, never produce anything good. It only produces death. The extreme of which we saw this past week, if you heard the horrific story in Pennsylvania, of a neighbor had a dispute over shoveling snow, and one neighbor went back in the house and came out with a weapon, shot his two neighbors. And it was horrific. And I thought, wow, how do things escalate? It's just snow. It's going to melt. <laughs> I mean, but it escalated to that point to where, you know, three people are dead because the guy shot the two people, then he went back in the house and he killed himself. Sad story. Over snow. Amen. Over snow. Foolishness. Forgiveness. We need to forgive other people. November 2020, there was an article out that featured, featured by the Mayo Clinic that listed eight benefits of forgiveness. I thought I'd share it with you tonight because Jesus came to grant us forgiveness, but that we might also forgive other people. And if you're walking around with unforgiveness, look, uh, these are some of the benefits you're missing out on. To forgive is to have healthier relationships. To have improved mental health, Amen. Less anxiety, stress, and hostility. To forgive can lower your blood pressure. You have fewer symptoms of depression. A stronger immune system. You know, it makes you healthy when you forgive people. That's a good workout, workout regimen, right? How about forgiving people? Didn't have to pay a membership or anything. Just forgive somebody. It improves your heart health. And improves self-esteem. Forgiveness 
we could say, produces spiritual health or spiritual health mentally, physically, and spiritually. In fact, the Bible tells us that. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Isn't that good? You want to get health? You want a healthier life? Forgive people. Instead of carrying that stuff around. Here's a believer's motivation for forgiveness. I always think of this when I'm tempted to hold a grudge or whatever. I remember, remember what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. He says, but if you do not forgive men their transgresses or trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's why I forgive people on the spot. Because I don't want God holding my trespasses. And I know it's under the blood, but it will cost me if I hold on. I'm not saying you lose your salvation, but it will cost you in your relationship with the Lord. If you can't forgive others, then God will neither will God forgive you. It will cost you in your relationship with God. And you know what? As the scripture says about the children of Israel, God gave them what they wanted, but he sent leanness to their soul. Did you know God wants you to be fat? That's an old King James phrase that it uses, that God wants you to delight in fatness, fatness. He wants you to be fat and full. Jesus said, I came to bring you life more abundantly. Amen. And so when you're overeating and somebody says something to you, just say, I'm just being biblical. Amen. (laughs) I'm trying to get fat. God wants me fat. And what he talks about there is about the fullness of life. Amen. Not being overweight so much, but but the fullness of life. But when when we walk in unforgiveness... We've been forgiven by God, but we won't forgive other people. You know, it sends leanness to our soul. That's what I mean by the Lord holding it. You know, he will not forgive you. He'll send leanness to your soul. Your relationship with the Lord will not be as vibrant, as fat, as full as it should be. So Christ came that he might grant us forgiveness, but also that we might forgive others. And then the third mission statement, if you will, of Jesus is that he provides an eternal inheritance, an eternal inheritance. It says in the latter part of verse 18, an inheritance among those who are sanctified. That word simply means to be set apart by faith in me. How are we set apart? Through faith in Jesus. God sets us apart for his glory. First Peter chapter one, verse three, the latter part of verse three, and then verse all the way to verse five says, his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, I love this, incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. Amen. (laughs) A little mood music, I guess. I don't know. Uh, By faith, kept by the power of God, Uh, through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I love that. Did you catch that? That God has given you an inheritance that's not kept by you, but is kept by the power of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We have a glorious inheritance in Jesus. Verses 19 and 20, as we continue on through chapter 26, in verse 19 and 20, uh, Paul shares his post-conversion experience whereby he obeys the voice of God and and does what the Lord tells him. In verse 21, as he's sharing his testimony here in verse 21, uh, down to verse 20, let's see, to verse 23. He says, but after, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm in the wrong chapter. All right, there it is, 21. He says, "For for these reasons... The Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God uh, to this day, I stand witnessing both to a small and great, saying no other thing than those which the, the prophets and Moses said would come. And then the, the Christ, or that the Christ rather, would suffer 
that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So Paul declares that's what he's called to do, he's, you know, according to the prophets and to the law of Moses, and to declare uh, Jesus Christ uh, to the Jewish people, light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Um, that's what he's done in his, after he was converted. That's his ministry uh, and sharing here his post-conversion experience. Yes, notice that uh, Paul declares here that uh, it was Jesus who delivered him, that the Lord delivered him. And um, it was not the Roman army that delivered him, but Christ delivered him. Uh, he said, for this reason, the Jews tried to kill me. He says, therefore, having obtained help from God. Help from God. It's just, well, the Romans came and delivered me from his hand. No, it was help from God. And I think sometimes we, we think that way, that, that, you know, that his people or someone came and bailed me out. No, it was all from the Lord. In other words, he was recognizing the Lord's sovereignty even in his deliverance. He could have given praise to the Romans or what have you, but he recognized that his help, that it comes from the Lord. And when we do that, you know, somebody may pay your bill or somebody may do something, but it's all coming from God. God is behind it all. He's the one that is sovereign behind all of it. So he doesn't praise the Roman army. He praises the Lord for delivering him. Therefore, having obtained help from God, I look toward the hills from which comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. And he was trusting God. He knew that God had delivered him. It wasn't Rome deliverance, but it was deliverance from the Lord. Acknowledging the sovereignty of God. Verses 24 and 25, read on. It says, now as he... Thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Paul, you're out of your mind. That was Festus' uh, <laughs> comment there. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. He's respecting him. I'm sure he probably wanted to call him something else. But I'm not mad, most noble Festus. But speak the words of truth and reason. Amen. Truth and reason. Paul's defense was based upon truth and reason. Two social commodities in short supply today. I was, I was looking at this title. It caught my attention on this article that I saw the other day. And the title was, uh, get it right here, and I quote, Oregon promotes teacher program that seeks to undo racism in mathematics. So I read on. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what it said, and I quote, the Oregon Department of Education, ODE, recently encouraged teachers to register for training that encourages ethno-mathematics. I'll say it again. Ethno-mathematics. And argues, among other things, that white supremacy manifests itself in the focus on finding the right answer, close quote. Yeah. So two plus two equals four is now racist. That's what they're saying. I thought math, uh, mathematics was, you know, there was no racism in mathematics because two plus two equals four. But if you focus on finding the right answer, you're racist. Thinking themselves wise, the Bible says, they became fools. If Jesus is not coming back soon, I don't know what kind of planet this is going to be <laughs> in the next 50 years. I mean, this is thinking themselves wise. They became fools. This is foolishness. And my wife and I were reading this morning, Psalm 19, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And here we see the evidence of foolishness, of fools. Are you kidding me? 
No, they're not. Here's an article. Amen. (laughs) Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 reminds us again that woe to those who call good evil or evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe, the Lord says, you're in trouble. When you start calling truth a lie. And we see a lot of that going on today. Do not be deceived. So Paul's defense was on was based on truth and reasoning. And today we don't see anything based on truth and reasoning. But we need to hold fast to both of those as believers. In verses 26 to 29. Uh See here I'm at. Okay, verse 26. Amen. It says, For the king before, for the king before, Paul goes on to say, whom I also speak freely, uh, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing uh, was not done in a corner. Paul says, You know what? My life was is public. The things that I've done, it wasn't in a corner. He says, King Agrippa, verse 27, King Agrippa, do, do you believe the prophets? And so he knew King Agrippa did. He was, a, he was a friend to the Jews, called the king of the Jews, or king of Judea. And he was very familiar with the Jewish customs and all that, as I said before. He said, then, uh, Agri- he said to Agrippa, said, <coughs> you know, do you believe in uh, the prophets? And he says, I know that you do. You do believe. You know, and then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me. To become a Christian. Almost only works in horseshoes, right? Not when it comes to salvation. You almost persuade me. Probably some of the saddest words in scripture. Because history records that it doesn't look like Agrippa uh, II came to Christ. You almost persuade me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today, might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Paul, being incarcerated under house arrest, had these chains on him, and he says, I wish you you were free in Christ, except for these chains. Almost. You know, either you know God or you don't know God. You're born again or you're not. You know, you can't just be almost. A Christian and uh, no more than you can be almost pregnant I guess amen years as you ain't amen and so Agrippa you know says he almost persuaded me to be a Christian but he continues to live his own life uh, apart from God and almost is not good enough and Paul says I wish that you would king that you would come to Christ verse 30 uh, when he had said these things uh, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Isn't that how the world knows? (laughs) You know, he's innocent. He's not doing anything worthy of death or chains. The accusations coming against him have not been proven, you know, at all. And then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But, you know, Paul wasn't interested in being set free. He was interested in the truth, the truth. Here's the conclusion tonight that I want to leave you with. I'll leave you with three things, uh, four things, actually, that uh, I believe we can glean from the passage, uh, these two chapters. And then next week, uh, Lord willing, we will get into chapter 27, and it really gets dicey, and Paul almost gets to Rome, but... Uh, uh, has a little accident along the way, as we'll see. Um, but what do we learn tonight? Number one, I think, is this. And that is, wait on the Lord and not on man. Wait on the Lord. If you're frustrated, maybe it's because you're waiting on people. You're waiting for the stimulus check or whatever. No, wait on the Lord. Because waiting on the Lord is not a waste of time. Waiting on the Lord is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Amen. Time is never wasted when waiting on God. I know it's what the devil wants you to believe. 
You're wasting your time. You need to do something. Just wait on the Lord. I thank God. Oh, man. So many times. Especially when you think someone is saying something about you and they're not saying anything about you. And you're, I'm going to go tell them, you know, Lord, just, just, you know, I have a 24-hour rule in my life. You know, I was like, if I feel anxious about something, the Bible says don't be anxious about anything but pray. Wait on the Lord. Pray for it. Pray about it for 24 hours. Give it 48 hours. There's amazing the difference they say. What a difference a day makes. Like, you know, one, the day before you're ready to cut that person's head off. No, I'm saying, yeah, I just love that guy, man. He just, yeah, really? <laughs> you know? Wait on the Lord. Your, your, your feelings can change or whatever. But sometimes it's waiting on the Lord to answer prayer. And God is faithful. Wait on the Lord. Don't get anxious. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. Here's the second thing that I think we learned tonight, and that is that we need to live, to live rather, to not offend in word, in temple, and in government. I like word, temple, and government. Word, temple could be, another word for it could be the, today, be the church. Lord, I don't want to offend your word. I don't want to live in such a way that's, that's <laughs> opposing your word. People look at my life and say, well, you're supposed to be a Christian and, and I'm living something opposite. I need to walk my talk, in other words. Uh, the second thing is, Lord, I don't want to offend the church. I don't want to be an offense to the church. You know, I want to serve the church. I want to edify the church. And the third thing is the government. I don't want to be someone that is you know, committing some crime or what have you, going against government and, and you, know, uh, you know, being a poor witness for Jesus Christ. And so in those things, live a life without offense. And the third thing is this, is that we learned is that is to stay on the path of truth and reason. Paul did not leave the path of truth and reason, even though he was in prison for two years and he's gone before, you know, he's before Felix, now he's before Festus and and all this kind of stuff, and, and yet he continued to speak the truth and reason. What does truth and reason mean? Well, stay on the path of God's word. That's true. God's word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Uh, stay on the path of God's truth of his word. Let his word guide you. And reason speaks of the wisdom of God. Look at things in your life through the lens of God's wisdom. What does God's word say? I always ask myself that in my, my hard drive, my brain, amen, that is really challenging the older you get sometimes. But, but I always ask myself, what, what does the word of God say about this? Now, how do, what does the word of God say about how I should react in light of what's going on in America today and that type of thing? You know what I do? I go back and I look at what Jesus did. And remember, Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, and uh, they said to him, uh, hey, you know, Herod, I think it was Herod Agrippa, Herod is out to get you. And remember what Jesus said? He said, go tell that fox that I'm going to keep on healing, I'm going to keep on preaching or whatever, you know. And I thought, then what should our response be today as Christians? And when people go, oh, the government's going to shut you down. Oh, the government's going to, go tell that fox that we're going to keep on doing what God told us to do. Amen? <laughs> we're just going to keep on doing it. So that, that helps me as a believer. So how should I respond today? Just keep doing what Jesus told you to do. You don't need to get out there and beat nobody up. You know, just be about your father's business. Amen. That helps me. But that's what it means is reasoning, truth and reason. Reason according to what? According to the wisdom of God's word. And then the last thing that I think we learned tonight is that God delivers us that we might through, he might through us deliver others. The reason I say that is because of verse 17 in chapter 26. Jesus said, this is why I'm, I've delivered you, Paul, so that you can be a witness to the Gentiles. I didn't just save you so that you can feel good about you, but I have something for you to do. God save you, save you that through you, he might minister to somebody else. Don't forget that this week. That's why we're here. He saved us that we might be a blessing to someone else. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight, Lord, the study going through the book of Acts, and, and uh, we thank you for your word, Lord, and some of the tidbits and things that we have seen here through Paul's experience, first before Felix and now before Festus, for Agrippa and Bernice and all, Father, and yet he doesn't change his tune. Help us, Lord, this week to be men and women of truth and of reason. Help us this week to be witnesses for Christ. We need your strength to do it, Lord. We cannot do it apart from you. 
Be glorified, we pray in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. And maybe somebody who's watching online and, and uh, people are coming to Jesus already. Amen. We've got two salvations online. We thank God for that. Thank you. Thank you for clicking the button. Make sure you fill, fill out all the information so we can send you free information so you can continue to grow in the Lord. But if you're here tonight and uh, you do not know Jesus Christ, you can open your heart to him right now, right where you're standing, and bow your head with me and repeat this prayer after me. From your heart to the Lord, not to some pastor at a building or a church, but to the Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. And I believe that you are risen from the dead. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins. Will you pray that? And then say, Lord, come into my life. I receive you tonight as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. My friend, if you pray that prayer, the Bible says that you're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. If you're here tonight and you prayed that prayer, I want to have, ask you to come forward while we're singing. Come forward at this time and meet with one of our pastors standing down here. And uh, they'll give you some free information to help you grow in the Lord. Or if you have a need for prayer for anything, make sure you come and meet with one of the pastors or Neil here at the steps. But let's spend the rest of our time, in a few minutes we have left, just worshiping our King. Amen. God bless you. Amen.
so thankful, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your reckless love that has kept us, dear God, regardless of what we may have gone through or going through, dear God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God, that we are called to wait upon you and not upon people, or situations and circumstances, Lord, but to look to you. Indeed, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord God Make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant to you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please drive careful. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming out tonight.